Well, welcome back to our discussion of waves on strings. Well, it should be back. Uh, let's hope you've already attended the last lecture on strings. If you haven't, then it's probably a good idea to go back and do that first, because this is a, a logical extension of that. And what we'll do today is we'll talk about the wave equation, the wave on string equation, and we'll include friction, and we'll include gravity, and then we'll include both together. So we'll see an extension. But it's an interesting extension because it really shows you how, if you solve this problem purely analytically, you're limited to just a linear equation with simple terms that everybody solves in all the textbooks. But now we can make the problem much more realistic. We can include friction. We can include gravity, which means we can include a tension that varies with the position on the string. And we can do that numerically with very little more work. I mean, the computer doesn't complain. And it's not much more analysis. And it's fairly straightforward. So it's a good example of how by using the computer, you can handle much more realistic cases. It still requires you to know the physics, maybe think a little more, but you're not limited. Okay, so let's get on. What do we have here? We have our string, as we've seen before. We have a string. Its ends are tied. So there's nodes at the end always. The height, y, is a function of position and time. So it's a one-dimensional problem is given by y. That's the disturbance, as we talked about before. The length of the string is l. And the distance from the left, from the origin, is what we call x. Okay. So the question is, how do we go about and include friction in the wave equation for just this problem? And if you remember, we solved a finite element. We just used Newton's law, f equals ma, for the finite element. So all we do is put friction in there. Why should we do this? Well, it's a fact of life. You know, you take a rubber band, you pull it, you bounce it back and forth. It decays. You know, strings don't vibrate forever. In fact, they, they uh, dampen out rather quickly. So friction clearly is important. It may have an effect. It has an effect, obviously, on shape. So let's do it. Friction, of course, is not a basic force of nature. There's many different models of friction. They have various validities. And we can use any model we want. We're really not limited. But we'll take the simplest one here. Well, not really the simplest. Next to the simplest. We won't assume friction is a constant. We'll assume friction is viscous, which means there's some constant here. We call it kappa, usually. And we say that the frictional force depends on the velocity. Faster things feel more friction. Slower things feel less friction. OK. So what else do we know about friction? Well, we know friction always opposes motion. Whatever direction motion is in, friction will be in the opposite direction. So we'll say, OK, so we'll make the frictional force proportional to the velocity, but with a minus sign. Since the velocity is to the right, the friction has to be to the left. That's OK. If we look at our string element here, we'll say, well, if the element gets bigger, there's more, more length to it, then it's going to be pushing through more fluid, which means there'll be a greater frictional force. So the frictional force will also be proportional to the length of the string element, which is just delta x for our small displacement assumption. So equation one here, we have the extra term we want to now include in the wave equation. The frictional force is equal to some constant my, 2 kappa. I don't know why there's a 2 there. That's just conventional. You know. Call it all kappa, I don't care. Uh, the length, delta x, of the element we're analyzing. And then the velocity of the string. So this is worthwhile remembering. dy dt is the velocity of the string, in this case, in the vertical direction, because that's how the string is vibrating back and forth. The wave propagates horizontally. You know, Pulse moves up and down the string horizontally. But the velocity we're talking about is not the wave velocity. It's the velocity of the string. Okay, so that's the frictional force. So how do we include it in? It's just f equals ma in the wave equation. Just repeat what we did before. So here is the acceleration term on the left. Okay? And we've divided through by the mass, which you can see here, there's rho. Okay? So that's, that's the, uh, the acceleration, the second derivative of the vertical velocity. This is just the force term we had before, the force due to the variation in the tension with position. So that's the second derivative of position with versus x. And this is the new term. Okay, So it's the frictional term, just like we've seen before. So that's what we have to solve. How do we go about solving equation 2? Well, the next slide, we tell you that it's your problem.
So, you can take a break right now. Go back to the computer. Do what you've done before with the wave equation, which we've given you the code for, but now generalize it to include friction. And don't look ahead in the book where we have some codes which have this. Do it on your own. Okay, so that's part of the learning. We gave you a sample which you know works. Now include it and see if most likely you have messed it up. But that's fine. You want to do that. Okay? So go ahead, use the code to solve the wave equation. What do you check? Well, the first thing to check, of course, would be if you got the sign right and everything else right, the wave should oscillate and then decay. If it doesn't decay, then it's not right. You can also do your coding if you're a little more conservative and then input kappa as zero. If kappa is zero, then you know it should be your old solution back. Make sure you get your old solution back. Increase kappa, see that the wave decays. And then you can play the game, and it's always worthwhile doing, which is to make the situation unstable. In other words, if kappa is less than zero, then the frictional force is in the same direction as the velocity, and it grows bigger. So the system should be unstable, and it's good for you to see what an unstable system looks like. Why is that? At least two reasons. One, because we talk about stability, particularly for the wave equations, and we talk about the Van Neumann or the Courant condition for stability, and that's a different kind of stability. That's numerical stability. This instability here that you'll get is a physical instability. It's actually in the mathematics. It has nothing to do with how we've approximated the equation. So see what unstable solutions look like. That's the first reason. Number two, you want to see how the computer programs behave when things become unreasonably large. Clearly, if, the, if, if it's unstable, the amplitude is very large. We've made small amplitude approximations in the wave equation. They should no longer be valid. Things should break up. You may get reflections. You may get wiggles you don't expect. I won't tell you what you're supposed to see. But whatever you do, you know, make it so it's large enough. Make kappa large enough so you see an effect and then reverse it. So here's what, of course, you're seeing. Okay? So this is actually that catenary wave we saw last time. That's the catenary shape. We'll talk about that later or today, even. And here we see a wave, and it stops. Okay? You know, it starts big, start big, big oscillations, and then they slowly fade away. When I look at this, I actually think I can feel it. You know, it's so realistic looking, it looks like a soft string, because that's what waves look like. So, very good. So let's see if we can get on and do something else. So we put friction in, or you did. That's easy. Now let's talk about variable tension. Look at this slide. Well, OK, the pictures are the same as before. And the difference now is the tension T, we imagine, is no longer a constant throughout the whole string. What we've see, we saw last time when we derived the wave equation first is the speed of propagation along the wave is given by a constant. We call it C, <coughs> typical for waves. That's the speed of the wave. And it's the square root of the tension divided by the density. And all you have to remember is the square root. because And then you have to figure out which is on top. And as you know, if you make the tension higher, if you stretch the string as expected, the wave should propagate more quickly. So the tension has to be on the top. If the string gets heavier or denser, heavier, slow things move more slowly, the speed decreases. So rho is on the bottom. That's right. Okay. And we're assuming that this is a constant, or we did assume that this was a constant, because the tension and the density was a constant. Okay. Now if you have a situation where the tension varies throughout the string, for example, if the density varies in different parts of the string, the tension will vary as well. And then we could say, OK, we still expect the wave to travel fast in regions of high tension and slow in regions, region, regions of low tension. We also could expect some kind of adiabatic approximation, which says that as long as t and rho don't vary too quickly, you can sort of solve the old wave equation more or less and use c to be dependent on a local value of t and rho. Probably not a bad approximation if there's not too much variation, but we don't have to make that approximation. We'll actually solve the problem. Okay? So we'll solve two kinds of problems. One will solve when we include gravity. 
So if we include gravity, that means we have to include tension varying as a function of position. Why? Well, because if you have a string here and the wave, the string itself, has mass, the endpoints have to support the weight, not just of its nearby region, but of the entire string. Whereas in the middle, the string only has to, to support the weight of itself, a small element. So the density might be constant, but the tension will vary throughout the string, okay, if you have gravity. Well, also, while we're doing it, let the, t the density itself vary, say, let's solve the most general equation. So we expect to have the tension, a function of position, and the speed, a function of position as well. And uh, it's worthwhile pointing out, even if we don't have gravity acting, if you have a density that varies, then the tension will vary. Because in regions of higher density, you need more tension in order to accelerate it. Now, if you have gravity, you have another complication. And you can play, once you get the simulation running, to see how gravity affects the wave propagation. You can turn that off, see how the tension affects it by itself for the different density, and so forth. In practical cases, you may notice sometimes these old chains on uh, ships, they're thicker at the end than in the middle and at the bottom. Why is that? Because the top has to support the weight of the whole chain. Okay, so that's what we expect. How do we do this? How do we do every problem in mechanics? We just apply Newton's law, F equals MA. Okay? And now we have a force term and MA. MA is not going to change, but the force term will. So what's new? Remember how we derived the wave equation. We said that the force is just the change in the vertical component of the tension. Okay, because that's the restorant force tending to push the string back in position. If the tension, if the vertical component of the tension was constant throughout the string, it nothing would bring it back. Okay? So it's just the change in the vertical component, which is what we have here. And this is the change is just dy by dx of the vertical component times delta x. Delta x is just the width of the component we're looking at. Fine. The only difference now is the tension, and this is now the vertical component, the tension at x, and this is the slope to get the vertical component. But now the tension is no longer a constant. So when we take the derivative, we get one term, the second term here, which is our old friend. That's what we had in the usual wave equation, the usual linear wave equation. And now we get a new term which vanishes if the tension were constant, but it's the derivative of the tension times the derivative of the displacement. And the right-hand side remains the same. It's just the ma term, m rho of x a d squared y dx squared. So that's the equation to solve. How do we do it? So let's look at the next slide and see if it works. OK. So we need, we need to develop an algorithm now, or extend the algorithm, for a case where the tension can vary along the string. It's obvious what to do. You know, you just wear it. You had t before. You now have t of x. That's not a, a biggie, OK? But we can actually have the density varying as well. So for a trial case, and this comes out of a textbook reference in our book, try the following. Try a density rho of x, which is exponential and try a tension t of x, which follows exponentially. And that at least makes some physical sense, where the density is highest, the tension is highest, because the tension has to push the density along. Okay? And this is nice analytic form and has two interesting things, aspects. One, you can put it in the equation, and you see how, what the wave equation looks like. So that's our wave equation. We now have a t of x to put in, rho of x to put in, of course, the exponentials will all cancel out, but we'll have some derivative terms. So we'll leave that to you and the textbook look through, through it. We can now derive the finite difference form of this equation, the discrete form. And again, as almost always, we're just using a central difference approximation for the derivative. So here we have a second derivative to approximate. Here we have a first derivative and another first derivative. So it gets more complicated. You get a few more terms in it, and here we have Second derivative. OK. So when we put all the pieces together, what we get, we derive in the book, is equation 2 here. So this is the discrete form. And we've written it 
in the leapfrog form, so we can use it as an algorithm. So let's see if we can make sense of this. Pardon me while I stare at it. Ugh. Okay, x and t. So y is a function of x and t. So the first index here corresponds to x. Okay? So let's imagine we have our space-time lattice here. So these are t's values, and these are x values. And let's see if this works. So the second index is the time. So this is t. So, aha, yes, the left-hand side, we've put the future time, f, let's say future. This is now the present. This is the present. This is the present. This is the present. Ah, this is working. Thank goodness. Okay, so we have an algorithm which takes us from the present here, and it steps one step forward to the future. That's fine, okay? And if we now say, what's involved, okay? So let's say we're trying to get position i in the future here. We have the same position in the present, which is here. We have now one position to the right in the present, which is there. We have one position to the left in the present, which is there. We have this guy in the middle again. We have the right, we have the right, and then we have present. So that's it. Okay. So this algorithm takes three values in the present, moves it ahead to give you the, the future. So it's a, a leapfrog time step, stepping algorithm. Uh, just, go, it's just a simple substituting derivative. So it's a good experience for you to do that and try it out. So solve the equation. The interesting case to try would be the case in which we have a standing wave. So see if this type of a density and tension variable can still have standing wave solutions. So the standing waves are just a product of position here and a product of time there. What this kind of system supports is it supports standing waves, except it acts as a filter. Sir, if you raise the, I'll let you figure it out. I'll give you a hint here. But if you raise the frequency too high, the system may not support a wave. If you, if you lower the frequency too low, it won't support it. So there's a range. See if you get that. See what happens. Okay, so, interesting. So let's go ahead now and continue for the full uh, generality with gravity as well. Now you've all seen this solution in life. Whenever you've looked at a telephone pole and you see the, the wire sagging, you've seen what's known as a catenary shape. And that's the sh static shape of a string or a wire or a chain under the influence of gravity. One often says a chain because the density makes it sag. If it's a wire and it's pulled too tightly, you don't see it sag as much. So this is a classical problem. Uh, we'll, we'll sketch the outline of the solution here. We sketch it even a little more in the book, but you can find it in classical books. And it's just, for this section now, it's just a static problem. We have no motion. So this is our string again. It looks like the same diagram, but it's not. And now we have something new happening. What we say is that, ooh, we have to be careful. We want to talk about a string which sags, you know. And so we have to include the fact that the equilibrium shape of the string is not a straight line. So we have a new two functions involved. We still will call our disturbance y of x, just because that's how we wrote the wave equation. But now we'll call the equilibrium shape, which is what we're solving for here, u of x. So u is the, going to be the shape of the string as a function of position. And the origin, to make things as simple as possible, will now, for this shape, use the middle. Doesn't matter, we can move it to the end, we just add a constant to it. When we take derivatives, they go away. Uh, and, and d here is just some height, which we'll define soon, but that'll be the height of the catenary shape from the axes. Okay, so with this simple, uh, with this choice of axes, the equation is very simple. So that's why we choose it, OK? So t of x, again, is the tension as a function of position. So the statics problem is twofold. One, what is the equilibrium shape? Two, what is the tension in the string as a function of position? For a string under the action of gravity. 
Okay, so how do we solve it? As usual, we look at a free body diagram, except now we look a little more carefully. So we consider this free body diagram right here in the middle, let's say. Here's the tension T0. So T0 is the tension which would exist if there was no gravity. It's a tension in the middle, let's say. Sine theta is the displacement. ds is now the arc length. And we have a string. We have gravity pulling down. We have the weight of the string pulling down. We have the tension in the string pulling up. And then, of course, we have the tension pulling across in this because the, on this element, there's two positions. So W is the weight of the section, and that has to be balanced by the vertical component. Okay, so let's go ahead. We can now solve this problem. So here, this next slide, slide 38, we just balance off all the forces. So here's our diagram again, and we say that the vertical component, which is T sine of theta, so the tension is T in the string, sine of theta is just the vertical component. That must be equal to the weight, w. The weight of w, is, of course, is just the uh, mass times g. And the mass is just the density of the string rho times the arc length, s, that we're talking about. So rho g s is the weight. The horizontal component of the force is just t sine cosine of theta. So t cosine of theta is t0, which is the tension in the string, say, at the middle, where, there's, um, where it's flat. OK, so we have an equation, one, two equations. If we divide through, we get one equation for tangent of theta is equal to rho g s divided by t0. OK, so that's an equation. And s is the arc length. It's a geometric problem now. What is the shape? Theta is just the deflection. S is the arc length. We have this equation to solve. How do you solve it? Well, that's where the classical mechanics people have worked very hard. Uh, it's not a trivial solution. It's not complicated. But you have to think hard. Okay? So you can look that in the book. Look that up in the book. And in red here, you see the solution. The solution is that the shape at equilibrium, the static shape u of x, is a cosh function, a hyperbolic cosine. So that's x to e to the x plus e to the minus x. And it's a function of x over d. d is this constant given in equation 4 here. So it's the tension divided by the density and g. Okay? So that is u as a function of x. So this height, which we call d before of the string above the origin, is also d. So we just displace the origin by d so that the shape has a simple form. And then the tension t as a function of x is just also cosh function. So we have two co hyperbolic cosines. We, we have an equation now for motion of the string. And we finally know what a realistic functional dependence is for the tension as a function of x. And that's right. So this says, ooh, the tension is a function of x. Cosh is greatest when x is 0. You know, it'll be greatest at the endpoints and smallest at the, uh, in the middle. OK, so let's go ahead. So now we have, we'll leave it for you to solve. We have the wave equation, equation 5, including f friction, if you want, including gravity, including the catenary shape. So let's look at what the solutions look like. So we've given you a code, Python. It was equation string.python. Modify it. Include friction. Include gravity now. Gravity, we know the catenary shape, so you know t of x. Do some exploration. Look for interesting cases. And look, I take your output and either create surface plots, one way of looking at a position, a function of both position and time, the other way of looking at a function of both position and time is to do an animation. So do surface plots if you like. Do animations. Do both. See if you can understand the physics. There's some interesting physics. In particular, see if you can s actually see non-uniform damping. What does that mean? Well, it means that if you have a wave, the velocity of the wave going up and down varies, say sinusoidally, typically, so that there'll be more damping 
at the most at the highest parts than at the lowest parts and that's what you should see okay so that's non-uniform damping see if you can see the facts and then always this question do normal modes exist in these non-linear or these non-simple cases so look for normal modes see if you can get a solution which is a standing wave cosine omega t times sine gamma of t so here in this illustration you see a uh, it's sort of an animation where we've pasted all the pieces together. It's not even a surface plot. Okay. So this is the initial pluck wave, but it's a pluck catenary. And what you can see is the pluck obviously has waves going on both sides, and it's being distorted in time in not an obvious way, in part because the frictional forces are not uniform. Okay. You know, the highest part has the greatest friction. There's less friction at the ends. So, it's an interesting case. See if you can get some interesting physics. So, we've taken the simple wave equation. We've shown you how to include friction. We've shown you how to include gravity. We've shown you how to include a tension that varies with position. Density that varies with position. Go ahead and explore. If you can pick up some interesting cases, go ahead. Get to work. And next time, we'll do some more waves again, but other kinds of waves. So, we'll leave you hanging on a string. Bye-bye.